I was always fascinated by comedy, and it's very strange when I look back on it. I, I can actually remember being ill in bed when I was 12 and using a school exercise book to write a, a script for two radio comics whom I used to listen to at that time. And when I was at Clifton, we used to have this little blue book with all the information in. And every time I heard a good joke, I used to write it, you know, on the white bits that didn't have print on. So there was something odd going on. And when I watched uh, comedy, I used to watch an enormous number of American sitcoms in the mid-50s, you know, like George Burns and Gracie Allen, uh, Jack Benny, Phil Silvers, Amos and Andy, Joan Davis. A lot of them were American, the majority. I realize in retrospect, it was almost as though I was, almost as though I was studying them or trying to understand what was going on in some way. I was obsessional about The Goon Show. And when I was at Clifton, I did a couple of entertainments, that is to say, I did kind of sketches. So there was something going on. But the whole point was, if you came from Western Supermare, you didn't go into show business, you became an accountant or a lawyer or possibly sold insurance. I mean, there were no other possibilities. So although I'd done some entertainments at school and I'd done sketches in front of audiences and quite enjoyed it, although I was terribly scared in terms of stage fright, I got to Cambridge and I got into the footlights completely by accident but found I could make people laugh. But I had no intention still of going into show business because in those days, 62, 63, people from Cambridge didn't think of doing it. Within three years, all the people who went to Cambridge were practically planning to go into show business if they had those kind of talents. And what happened was I did the, the Footlight show, which was a kind of, like in America, the hasty pudding show at Harvard. Um, a review show lasting two hours, and I did that in 62, and I thought it was terribly good, which it wasn't, but I thought it was terribly good. So in 63, I very nearly didn't do the show, especially because I hadn't done much work that year, and I thought I might fail the exams. But I did it in the end, and to my surprise, one day, after I got off stage and went up to the Footlights Club room to have a drink, there were two very nice men in dark suits who said, how would you like to come and work for the BBC as a writer and a producer? Because they'd noticed that I'd written the material. Interesting. Not the performer side, but the writing side. And I said, well, um, why not? And I thought about it. I could sell it to my parents because it was the BBC. So there was a pension plan. You know, it was like joining the civil service. And uh, from a money point of view, they were offering me £30 a week. And if I had gone into the law, which is what I was studying at Cambridge, I'd have got £12 a week. And I wasn't very attached to the law, so I kind of, I was out of there. <laughs> Once I finished with Python, all I knew, oddly enough, is that I wanted to do something with Connie Booth. We were married at the time. And I didn't know what, but I went and talked to Jimmy Gilbert, who was the head of Light Entertainment, and I said, I'd like to do something with Connie. And he said, fine, we'll go, you know, come back with an idea. And I went back and I said to Connie, they'd like us to do a pilot. What shall we do? And we spent about 20 minutes deciding we couldn't do the sort of Mike Nichols, Elaine May stuff, because that had been done and also very well done by the two Johns and, and um, Eleanor Braun. And then I said, what about that hotel we'd stayed in? Because when Connie had been um, occasionally doing parts in Forty Tower, she'd come down to Torquay and she had stayed at this amazing hotel run by Mr. Sinclair. It was called the Glen Eagles Hotel. He was the rudest man I've ever met. He was wonderful. And all the other Pythons wouldn't put up with it. They moved out and went to stay in the Imperial, which was a lot better. And he was so extraordinarily rude. I mean, one day we were all at dinner and Terry Gilliam was uh, eating as Americans do. That is to say, they, they cut the meat like this, and then they cut it all up, and then they put the, the knife there, pick the fork up in the right hand, and spear the meat. And he was walking by, and he looked down at Terry, and this look of astonishment across his face, and he said, we don't eat like that in this country, he said. And on another occasion, Eric Idle left his briefcase by the front door in the morning, because we'd had to wait for the cab and he forgot it. And then in the evening he got back, he said, I left my briefcase. Mr. Sinclair said, yes, it's the, it's the far side of, of the wall. And Eric looked out at the main entrance where he was pointing and there was the swimming pool, the far side of the swimming pool, there was the wall. And he said, well, you mean the other side of the wall? He said, what? He said, Eric said, well, what, what do you think? Um, why, did you put, why did you put it there? And, and, and Sinclair said, um, uh, uh, we, we thought it might be a bomb. 
And Eric was astounded because this was pre-69, pre, pre the resumption of the IRA bombing. And, and Eric said, well, why a bomb? And Mr. Sinclair said, well, we've had some staff problems recently. So he thought somebody was coming back to blow up his hotel. So this extraordinary man was, was very, very big in my memory and Connie's. And within a very short time, we'd, we'd figured out that that was where we wanted to set the hotel. But the interesting thing is nobody thought it was a good idea. All the expert advice we got was, well, it's going to be very claustrophobic in the hotel, you know. You must try and get outside. And when we wrote the first script, there's a famous memo, which the current head of light entertainment has on the wall of his office, saying that this is a very boring uh, situation f and the script uh, has nothing but very cliched characters. And I cannot see anything uh, but a disaster if we go ahead with it. And that's on the wall. And a great friend of mine, Ian Johnston, who helped me write Fierce Creatures, heard three producers at the bar say, oh dear, have you seen this new script, please? Oh, it's terrible, why do you ever leave Monty Python? So it's kind of fascinating that when you try and do something new, as William Goldman, the screenwriter, says, nobody knows, nobody ever knows whether it's going to work or not. I love the first series of Forty Towers. It was one of the most exciting times of my life because it was as though someone had opened the gate to a field of flowers that no one had picked before, and you were able to sort of gamble through the gate, and there were flowers everywhere. We'd, we'd entered a new territory, and it was as though almost everything we, we thought of for about a year seemed or felt original. There was no immediate positive critical reaction. Uh, I think the Daily Mirror said, Long John, short on jokes after the second episode, and one of the Edinburgh papers said it was very poor. And then there was a sort of a rumble of, of fairly positive reaction towards the end. And then the second, when they repeated it for the second time, that's when suddenly it started to take off. But my experience has always been that if you do something that is original, it takes a little time for any kind of momentum to build up. And in fact, that's a terrible problem this day. In fact, that's a terrible problem these days with movies, because if you don't score in that first week, there's another movie coming in and they take you out. So there's no time for a movie to sit in a cinema anymore and get an audience. And that means that original stuff is, it's at a disadvantage. Because I once said to a marketing man, what's the hardest type of movie to sell? And he said, anything original. <laughs> Connie and I had no idea that it was going to have the impact that it did. I mean, I always assumed it might pick up half the Python audience. And, of course, the Python audience was not that huge. It was rather smart, because it was very much the comedy of ideas. But um, Forty Towers was much more a comedy of emotion, and more people were able to plug into it. So as far as I remember, we got quite substantially bigger audience figures than Python. But we had no idea. We were just writing this little thing that we thought was funny. And when you hear years later that it is liked all over the world, there's a kind of puzzlement about why it travelled. And I guess that the reason it travels is that these that the characters are in some way archetypes. They're, they're the types who crop up in all the different cultures. But I have to say there's a slightly different reaction in this country from what well, there is in other countries. In this country, a certain number of people assume that I must be Basil. They do not see that this is a kind of a performance. They forget that Connie wrote it with me. They kind of think that I wrote it and I just wrote myself and I performed myself. This doesn't happen in other countries. In America, for example, people accept that it was a bit of writing and performing like any other performance. And I think it's because I caught something about the British character that was so essential to a certain kind of lower middle class conglomeration of attitudes that it struck home and caused me to be identified with this wretched character, this awful man, ever since. I've always had a tremendous love for farce. And I think it's because what I like to do more than anything else is to really laugh. You don't do it so much as you get older, but in your teenage years, there are some times when you just laugh and you laugh so much that it hurts and you wish you could stop laughing, wonderful feeling. You don't get that so much as you get older, although you get it a little bit in, on stage. Like as a kid, you get it in church, because it's, it's kind of forbidden, and that gives it an extra sweetness. Similarly, on stage, if somebody breaks you up, 
that business about trying not to laugh, that gives it a certain sweetness and it can become almost convulsive again. There was um, an extraordinary emotional reaction we used to have when we used to think of things that would happen to Basil. Because in a sense, we were like gods playing with this man's life. And sometimes when we would think of what would happen next, we would howl with laughter. And then we would think, oh, poor man, you know? Because as somebody pointed out years ago, comedy is very light tragedy. It's just a question of whether you're sympathetic to the people who are suffering or whether you're standing back a bit and laughing at them. Henri Bergson said, uh, comedy requires a momentary anesthesia of the heart. You have to be a little bit cool towards the people that you're watching, even if there's a fundamental affection before you can laugh at them. Otherwise, all you do is, oh, poor man, oh, terrible. But we had that double reaction. We'd laughed first, and then we would feel sorry for him. Great comedy is always about things happening on different levels because people talk, say that comedy is about conflict and people often think that means that character A has got to be head to head with character B. But the interesting conflicts are within people when something has happened which is absolutely <laughs> terrible but they're having to pretend that it's fine. But if you see them just thinking it's terrible, it's not funny. It's the fact they have to keep up the act. So any time that someone is doing something at one level and something almost contradictory in conflict with it is happening at another level, it's funny. But the thing about farce is that it... it, 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 it I think I'd have put it. The thing about farce is that everything is happening in an exaggerated way that although you may start it quite low-key and quite real, it kind of winds up and people get more and more frantic. They may be trying to keep the frantic feelings in and try and present some sort of calm facade to someone they have to impress, but you know that inside they're like this. And what I love is the intensity of the emotion because with that, comes more frantic behavior, more energy, and the possibility of huge laughs. I mean, the best, I think the best evenings of my life have almost all been spent at the National Theater when they do farces, like the Fado farces. So what a lot of people haven't spotted is that Faulty Towers are just little 30-minute farces that start very, very low-key and finish up absolutely frantic. <laughs> I, I thought it was wonderful when I heard that Forty Towers was being used as a training film, I think by the Hyatt chain and one other chain in London. But it didn't really surprise me because, you see, we started Forty Towers. The first series is 75, and uh, Tony J. Peter Robinson, Michael Peter, and I started Video Arts in 72. So I'd already done quite a number of videos about customer relations, selling across the counter, selling services. And I had a pretty good idea by that time of how you really were supposed to treat customers. So it was very simple doing the opposite <laughs> with Basil. And a lot of the time it was absolutely as simple as that. You knew what the rule was and you broke it. And sometimes you find that Things happen in hotels that are so wonderfully funny and creative that you could never have thought of them. My favorite one is, you know when you arrive in a hotel, you have this utter, uh, what's the word, delusion that the room is in some way yours. Whereas in fact, the hotel is full of people who want to get into the room. They want to restock the minibar, uh, they want to pull the curtains, they want to turn down your bed, they want to do... So you, you have to remember, you walk, it's not your room. You have to put up the do not disturb sign just to get any peace at all. And on one occasion, I had about three interruptions, I finally put up the do not disturb sign. And five minutes later, as I was lying on the bed, doing across, I don't believe this. So I go to the door and I open the door and there's a young man, bellhop, standing outside, pointing at the do not disturb notice, saying, is this supposed to be out here? Now you couldn't, you know, you couldn't make that up. And at a time I stayed in the Randolph Hotel in Oxford and I did a very, very good dinner at Merton College. Superb dinner. I got in rather late. Went off to sleep with a late alarm call and at 5.45 I'm... Brr, brr. Oh, they said, Mr. Cleese, is your alarm call? So I said, no, no, it may well be somebody else's. It is not mine. Mine is 8.30. Thank you. And you're just in that lovely dropping off. 
you pick it up and say, just to apologize for waking you up. You know, there's some things you can never invent. <laughs> thing about the beating the car sequence is, is how technical it is, is it took a very long time to find a branch that was right. We tried beating it with a fairly rigid branch and it wasn't funny at all and we tried beating it with a floppy branch and that didn't work and then we finally got a branch that had the right degree of flexibility and it became terribly funny and it showed that now no matter how good an idea is there's always an enormous amount of getting it right technically which nobody knows unless they actually do it people always talk about in the abstract as though any branch would have been funny. Similarly, when he's cursing the car, it is much funny that, funny that that sound is kind of contained, as though it's coming from inside a sort of goldfish bell, than if you heard it at full volume from inside the car. And often you don't know why these things are the case, and you just have to stumble around trying things until you discover what works. <laughs> At the beginning, I wrote most of Basil and most of Manuel, and Connie wrote most of Sybil and most of Polly. And I found it very interesting, because I'd sometimes suggest lines for Sybil, and she'd say, no, no, a woman would never say that. And I think, <laughs> But gradually, she started to write more of Basil, and I started to write more of Sybil. And then we just kind of cooperated more and more on, on all the characters. Then we, the one the two of us loved the most was the Major. We loved this guy who was in his own world and never quite understood what was going on, but always added his own insane interpretation of it. And Ballard Barclay, he's no longer with us. I was hugely fond of him. He was a wonderful fellow. And it's, having had a very distinguished career, it was lovely that right towards the end of it, he had this huge hit. But he was like me, he was an insane cricket fan. And when I'd be in the rehearsal room uh, playing a scene with Sybil, I'd glance over Sybil's uh, shoulder and I'd suddenly see Ballard doing this, which meant that there were six Australian wickets down. And he was, <laughs> I just love that man. And then the old ladies were absolutely terrific. And it was a very happy group because everybody was very pleased with what they had to do. Nobody was trying to build their part up, you know, everyone was happy, so that was good. And then we, each week you'd have some guests in. Getting Connie's character right was not too difficult because she is the sensible one. But she's also Basil's confidant. When he gets in terrible trouble, he will go to, to Polly and say, this has happened and this is what I have to achieve. And it's terribly useful as a, bit of, as a writing device to have someone. Somebody once described her as Horatio to Hamlet. You know, it's, it's wonderful to have some, someone that the protagonist can go to and say, this is what I have just done and this is what I'm going to do next if there's any doubt about what's happening in the plot. She, in the pilot episode, was a philosophy student. And we didn't feel that that worked as well as art students, so we re-recorded just a little, maybe four or five minutes, and cut that in to the first episode before it was transmitted to the general public. Sybil, I think, is much, much stronger and more independent than Basil. She could really function perfectly well if Basil buzzed off or fell under a bus. I don't think Basil could. I think he's very, he's much more dependent on Sybil, and that's why he's much more frightened of her than she is of him. My little nest of vipers. I always liked that. It was funny, you never really minded the things that Basil said to Sybil because she was never hurt by them. You see, if she'd been hurt by them, then it wouldn't have worked. Uh, there's a certain degree of discomfort that people can tolerate in, com in comedy, but they don't want to see anyone in real pain, or at least not in this kind of comedy. Probably not in any kind of comedy. So it was water off a duck's back. She just give, uh, didn't give a damn. So although the insults were funny, they were fundamentally ineffectual, and that's why we could get away with them. I think that Prue began to develop a laugh, and I think she and I talked about it a bit at one point, because I remember it was... <laughs> No, deeper than that. Ah! <gasps>
and I described it one script as somebody machine gunning a seal, which is a very good description. Um, but I think that was something, again, we worked on. And that was the delight of going into the shows after we'd done one or two, and we were able to borrow from what the actors and actresses were beginning to create, and we were beginning to incorporate that in the script. Connie and I had a different conception. I can't remember now, through the mists of time, what it was. But we had a different conception of the character from the way Prue played it at the first read-through. And I remember going home and saying to Connie, what do you think about the way Prue's playing it? And I was saying, well, it's not what we thought of. We were a bit worried. And then after about two days, we actually saw that what she was doing was better and worked better than the way that we thought it would be played. And so that helped us, because when we came to write the second episode and the rest of them, we began to have her voice in our ear, which we didn't have when we wrote the first one. I'd seen Andrew in a marvellous play by John Mortimer called Habeas Corpus, and he had just made me laugh till I hurt, and I realised how good he was at physical comedy. Um, and so I got him, and he just, this just touched something in him, because he's so quiet, he's immensely thoughtful, extraordinarily kind man, very considerate, and that rather quiet, almost introverted. And then you put that moustache on him, and he goes, ding! And this energy explodes, and it's, it's you know, something just comes through that you don't normally see. But one of the points I was trying to make with Manuel was not that Manuel was some kind of an idiot or something. That wasn't it at all. What annoyed me when I went into a lot of uh, British hotels and restaurants, particularly one particular chain of steakhouses, is that almost nobody there spoke any English at all. So that the chances of you getting what you ordered were about one in six. And I knew what that was about. That was not about the fact that foreigners were stupid. It was about the fact that the owners were not prepared to pay proper salaries. So they got people who were desperate for any kind of work. They did not bother to train them. They did not bother to make sure that they could speak English properly. And that was the fundamental joke about Basil and Manuel, because Manuel is one of the sweetest people. You know, he's always trying to get it right. There's no way you can blame him except that his English is not quite as good as it might be. And that's, that's Basil's fault, because Basil doesn't pay to give him extra, you know, English lessons as he should. We saw Basil as someone who was tremendously class conscious, who was always trying to become a little bit grand, who adopted attitudes of superiority over people that were really quite unjustified, and someone who was fundamentally terrified of his wife. So if you look at the episodes, they're almost all fueled by the fact that he is trying to hide something from Sybil. It's always struck me, and I don't know if the British newspapers carry this out, but people who aren't getting enough sex are fascinated by it, even if the fascination takes the form of being very, very cross <laughs> that other people are getting some. And that's obviously Basil's problem. I mean, I'm not quite sure when he... Sybil last did it, but um, it's a very, very long time ago, somewhere around the Second Punic War, I suspect. And uh, the, the, the essence of that was all about how disapproving he is and how he tries to catch them at it. And, and I enjoy very much the degree of how he, how he gets worked up. You know when people always say, I'm not a prude but, which always means I am a prude and. And it was, it was an exploration of all that stuff. The episode in the first series, it's about Basil's dislike of any kind of sexual behaviour at all, and some very, very good uh, lines at the beginning about uh, how people dress. And uh, Basil, as, as Sybil says, Basil's idea of he's so sexy, attractive man is Earl Haig. <laughs> and uh, she points out that he did actually wear his decorations, which is quite interesting, because it's all right in your army to have all these brightly coloured things on you, which is an interesting thought. But the, uh, the key to all that is Basil's utter embarrassment about any kind of talk about emotion and all his assumptions about what uh, psychotherapy is. Because in the British press still, you constantly see analysis and psychotherapy attacked for what it isn't. 
it's very strange. I suppose it's very hard for some people who haven't been through it to understand what the process is. And maybe I've been lucky with the therapists that I've had because there are bad therapists in the same way there are bad plumbers and bad doctors. Because you had a bad doctor doesn't mean necessarily all orthodox medicine is rubbish. The same way if you've had a bad therapist, as I think Faye Weldon felt that her ex-husband had, it doesn't mean that all therapists and all psychotherapy is useless. But it makes people anxious because people on the whole do not want to look at themselves. I mean, it's the first lesson in life. There's a small group of people who do want to look at themselves. Most people are pretty uncomfortable about it. And uh, the presence of those two psychiatrists brings out all Basil's fears that uh, somebody might actually start looking into what's going on inside him. Well, you really see what an awful man Basil is because he has no interest <laughs> in other human beings as human beings at all. They are either objects of derision and scorn or an opportunity to, to improve his position in the social hierarchy. And um, in this particular case, it's the, it's the professional hierarchy. You know, can he get a good recommendation for his hotel? And I love the idea that by having different people arriving and him never quite knowing which one of them was the inspector or not, he would switch from one way of addressing them to another and back again without any kind of consistency so that you could see really what a bastard he was. I mean, that's the thing about Basil. He's an absolutely awful human being. But the strange thing about comedy is that if an awful character makes people laugh, think of W.C. Fields, people feel affectionate towards him. It's insane because if they had to sit next to him for five minutes at a dinner, they would, they would absolutely not be able to cope with him. They would loathe him. But because he makes them laugh, they think deep down he's all right, and he isn't. <laughs>
very happy with the overall show, but wasn't very happy about a couple of the little bits with her as the philosopher. And I said, don't worry, we can redo those. The main thing is we, got, we basically got the show right. And one or two of my closest friends who know my work well were very pleased with it and encouraged me a lot so that I felt that we were all right. We were onto something good. <laughs> So many people have said to me, you're going to do any more 40 Towers, and the, the, you're up against an expect. I could not win. I could not win. If I had to go back now, I think I probably would not do Fierce Creatures. You're up against an expectation that absolutely cannot be matched. And uh, the thing is, do something different. I like working with the same team again and again, because if you have a good team, why break it up? But the fact is, the same team brings the same expectation. Also, trying to make 40 Towers work at 90 minutes would be very difficult, because as I said earlier, you can build it like that for 30 minutes, but if you're in a movie, then there has to be a trough and then another peak, and I, it, it doesn't interest me. I had an idea for a plot. I love the idea of Basil being finally invited to Spain to meet Manuel's family and getting to Heathrow and then spending about 14 hours there waiting for the flight, you know, and finally getting on the flight, being furious. And then a terrorist <laughs> pulls a gun <laughs> and tries to hijack the plane and Basil is so angry he overcomes the Terrorist. When the pilot says, we have to fly back to Heathrow, and Basil says, no, fly us to Spain or I'll shoot you. <laughs> Arrives in Spain, immediately arrested, spends the entire holiday in a Spanish jail, is released in time to go back on the play with Sybil. But it's, it's funny, isn't it? Um, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I think the great secret is that the scripts were very good, and they were very good, I think, for two reasons. One is for a start, that there was an awful lot in them. The average BBC half hour, 65 pages. Forty Towers, we used to do 135 to 140 pages. We literally did twice as many. Camera cuts, average shows got 200. We used to have 400 camera cuts. So there was an enormous amount in it. The other thing is they were very well constructed. And what Connie and I discovered worked for us was that we never really started to, bar to write the dialogue until we got the plot worked out. So we would spend sometimes as much as two and a half weeks on a plot. Not always the same one, because if we got stuck, we'd sometimes put it to one side and pick up another one that we were halfway through and try and run with that. But we never really bothered to write the dialogue, as I say, until we'd really got the story worked out in considerable detail. You always have to change it a bit, because you can never visualize it all when you've just got the storyline there. And you'll find that one scene that you'd imagine doesn't work because Basil comes into it in a different frame of mind or in a different mood from what you need. So you're always having to change, rejig it a bit. But that was the key. We never started until we had the story. So we always knew where we were going. Some people try to write comedy by starting scene one and they start writing the dialogue. Well, the chances of them getting to a satisfactory ending a one in a hundred. You've got to kind of know where you're going while you're building the thing. One of the characteristics of those episodes is that there's always one key idea. But what we often tried to do along with that key idea was to have one or two other subplots, other threads running. And they would run parallel for a time and then hopefully they would become intertwined. And by the end, the last five minutes, they would all come together. That's what we managed to do in the best of the episodes. But the most useful thing we used to do was to ask people for ideas, people who were in the business. For example, Connie and I were on holiday in Monte Carlo for two weeks, and we met a very nice woman who was just sort of helping us with the hotel, and we had uh, coffee with her. And we, we said to her, what's the most difficult kind of guests that you have? And she described Mrs. Richards 
absolutely perfectly. And we wrote it all down, the fact that they always complain about everything, but they don't want it changed, they just want a reduction. And this business of strategic deafness, hearing what they want to hear. And she just gave us a character portrait. Another time I said to a great friend of mine called Andrew Lehman, who was a restaurateur, I said, uh, what was the worst problem you had when you used to work at the Savoy Hotel? And he said, oh, the stiffs. I said, what? He said, oh, getting rid of the stiffs. I said, well, what do you mean people died a lot? Oh, he said, oh, a lot. He said, the old dears. I'm afraid they know the Savoy will always treat them really well and do these things, so they would sometimes check in with a bottle of pills, take them in the night. In the morning, <laughs> Savoy staff would walk in, pick up the pills, and we got another one. And then the problem was getting, getting the stiffs into the service elevator without alarming the other guests. Well, once you've been given that, that as an idea, I mean, it's kind of, it's just wonderful. And then you put a doctor in the hotel and... Uh, it's, it's a kind of a joy. Some of those, some of those worked out very well. It's interesting because sometimes we had a wonderful ending for the dead body when we couldn't use it. The guy who died and who, you know, gets put in the basket and all that stuff, we thought it would be terribly funny if we'd established without Basil knowing that he had a twin brother. So after Basil had finally got him in the, in the basket, the twin brother would walk in and come up to the desk and Basil would abuse him. <laughs> mindless practical joke and we couldn't do it because there was no way of basil telling the twin that his brother was dead you couldn't do that in a comedy show you see what i mean so it was a great shame it would have been too it would have been too difficult mixing that kind of emotion Timing is all important, and the hardest uh, thing is to get it well enough rehearsed. Now, five days was never really enough, plus the day in the studio, to get it right. And what happened was that we did anything between 20 and 25 hours editing on each show. Almost every minute you see up on the screen, we spent one hour editing. And it was only by doing that that you could just tighten it up and just tighten it there and take out a line of dialogue there and sometimes take out a repetition there or then lose two lines of dialogue there. That's what really got the pace on it. And there wasn't time to get it that good in terms of just the rehearsal period in the studio recording. It felt to me very much like a team because uh, in the first series, John Howard Davis, second series, Bobby Spears, and Prue, and Andrew, and Connie and I listened to each other a great deal. And people, you know, if I was doing a scene with, let's say, with Sybil, with Prue, then Connie and Andrew would just sit there watching, and after a time, they might easily, Andrew might say, what about that, or that isn't quite working. But because Carney and I had written and then rewritten the scripts, there wasn't an enormous amount of, of script rewriting. They were more or less right most of the time. But how we did them was very much a cooperative thing with lots of suggestions coming in. And I just did a, an American show, Third Rock from the Sun, and it was lovely. It was just like 40 Towers again with about six key people giving ideas and nobody bothering whether their idea was accepted or not it was just that sense of making it as good as possible <laughs> All the BBC shows at that time were always recorded with a live audience and um, it was kind of understood that you didn't use uh, any kind of sweetening, you didn't use any kind of canned laughter. We did sometimes, and I'll tell you what we did, occasionally you'd have something on film uh, and the audience would of course have to watch that on the monitors and then that would cut back to the studio and the audience would still be watching the monitors and they would fail to see that we were supposed to be back in the studio. And sometimes you would find that there would be a complete silence after a joke because the audience is looking in the wrong place or they're still looking in the studio when they should be looking up the monitor. And then we used to take one of our own laughs off the soundtrack and put it in the, in the place if it needed it. But I said to the actors very early on, I had a theory about this, I said, we're not going to play this at the pace of the studio audience. 
I said, we don't have to. In the theater, you have to go at the pace of the audience because they can't hear you otherwise. You have to wait for that laughter to curb, you know, the laughter curb to come down. Then you start speaking again. But in television, you have this wonderful thing called a microphone that's there. And if you talk into the mic while well, the audience is still laughing, then the wonderful thing is the people at home can hear it. So you can keep the pace up. And when people are watching at home, there's only one or two of them. It's not like being in an audience in a theater, so they don't laugh as much. So what you have to do is play it faster when people are you know, at home in ones and twos than you ever would if you were doing it in front of a full audience. So we deliberately ignored the studio audience and tried to play it faster than was right for the studio audience in order to get the sufficiently rapid pace of the people at home. The second show that we did, which was about the builders, was performed almost entirely to complete silence. And it was not a very comfortable experience. And um, afterwards, I was a bit disturbed. And people said, no, no, it was, it was a funny show. Actually, I think it's the least good of the 10 shows, the 12 shows. But, you know, they said, no, it was fine, it was funny. And I said, well, what about the audience? And they said, well, we don't know. We found out later that a large number of people from the Icelandic Broadcasting Corporation had visited the BBC that day. And the BBC were always helpful to shows like mine. Thought, wouldn't it be nice if we put all 70 of them in the front row? And they sat there being very uh, pleasant and charming and Icelandic and not laughing at all, just this faint whiff of cod coming from the front row, which had we recognized, might have given us the explanation. And I've got to say, uh, it was a pretty tough recording and it needs quite a lot of editing to tighten it up. <laughs> Forty Towers took a little time to get started. It didn't pick up a very big audience, the first series. It's suddenly on the repeats. You got the impression something was happening, some kind of groundswell of approval was happening. Uh, the critics... Uh, began to quite like it towards the end of, this, of the first series. And after that, on the whole, the criticisms were very good. But Connie and I found doing the second series probably as difficult as anything we'd done because the hardest thing in this business is to deal with unreal expectations. I mean, the problem with Fierce Creatures was not Fierce Creatures. The problem with Fierce Creatures was Fish Called Wanda. People thought not only that it was going to be as funny, which is unlikely, because at the time it was arguably as successful as any British film ever made, so lightning was not likely to strike in the same place twice. But there was also a feeling it would be in the same style, and because it was not in the same style, people couldn't see what style it was in. Now, the problem we had with the second series of 40 Towers is that the expectation was unreasonably high, because I realised that people were already remembering the first series as better than it was. Because if there's three or four things in the first series that are really funny, the audience remembers that as the kind of general standard rather than the highlights. Then they expect the second series to be at the highlight level all the way through. So it was a huge effort to get those scripts as good as I think they finally were. About six weeks each. <laughs> If you think about fast, because of the high level of energy, the kind of mania involved, people have to get very wound up. And it's easier to do that in the context of subjects that make people particularly anxious, which usually means taboo. So if you look at a lot of the 40 Tires episodes, you'll find that one's about dead bodies, um, one's about rats, which people are like that about. One's about a woman who pretends that she's deaf. It's a little bit dodgy here and there. There's a lot of taboo in there. And anybody in comedy knows that if you get into taboo areas, if it's done right, two things happen which are both good. One is that you're exploring something that is a little unfamiliar and a little dangerous and a little exciting and therefore a little bit interesting. And secondly, it arouses a degree of anxiety, which means that people laugh more. I mean, the basis of sexual jokes, 99% of which are not the slightest bit funny, is that they harness people's anxiety and embarrassment about sex so that they get big laughs. As, a, as I say, very few of them, I think, are actually funny. In the whole 12 episodes, there are only two jokes the BBC ever objected to. I think Bill Cotton was worried about two. One had already been cut. 
And the other one I was very unsure about. I think it was a reference to one of the concentration camps, just when Ben Basil was getting very confused, the word popped up. And I was not very sure about it myself. And when Bill said, can you, I'm worried about that, I just cut it. But we didn't have any pressure. And the PC lobby, the politically correct lobby, is something I don't understand because a lot of what I see on television now, both here in America, seems to me much riskier than we would have got away with, even in the Python days. And then at the same time, you hear about these politically correct movements, which I think are by and large run and staffed largely by obsessionals. There's, there's a good idea at the back of political correctness, but it gets taken ad absurdum. And I think that the danger is this. If you're in a group of people and you find that one person is particularly touchy, they have difficulty controlling their emotions, greater difficulty than the other people in the group, then you can't have so much fun about them because they're touchy and they're likely to explode. So when they're around, you're not as relaxed, you're not as spontaneous, you can't be more real. You have to kind of be more formal. Now, if you find that society is being run by the touchiest members, then in a sense, that's a bit sick because you're trying to take as the general standard the standard of the people who have the greatest problem controlling their emotions in that area. <laughs> In that anniversary program, Basil actually is thinking of someone else for a short period of time before the panic overtakes him. And you do get the impression that there is something positive underneath all the other stuff between him and, and Sybil. And Connie and I particularly liked that episode because we felt that we were beginning to explore character a little bit more. It was a little less farcical. It was a, I remember we thought it was a little bit more in the area of Alan Aitborn, whom we both adored. And uh, we liked that episode a lot, and the great joy of it was we had much longer to rehearse it than we normally did. Because we got about five days into rehearsal, and a splendid thing happened. A BBC executive got into an into a argument with a rigger, someone who puts the lights up, and, and eventually punched him. And the unions went on strike, and we couldn't record the program on the ordinary day, and it was postponed. They settled the, the, the strike, and everything was put off a week. And Julian Holloway was unable to do the second week because he had another commitment. And we brought in dear Ken Campbell, whom I've always adored. He's such a marvellous, strange, funny man. So he was the only one who was new. And we had all this time to rehearse it, and it was really really good because everyone was able to get familiar with the show and then bring little things to it so it's one of the, I think it's one of the very best episodes I watched Basil the Rat last Sunday as part of a sort of fundraising thing and I was very very pleased with it there's a particular scene at the end when uh, he and Manuel are, are talking to a young couple and they're really not taking in anything the young couple is saying. They're just trying to see where the rat is. I thought it was extraordinarily funny and yet I couldn't explain quite why I found it so funny. And I love the denouement, the way that we finally get uh, <laughs> Polly presenting the box of biscuits. <laughs> the little rat they're looking at the inspector. And Basil actually says, would you care for a rat? Because what else do you say there? So, and the actor, damn, I forgot his name. He's so good, who is who just looks at the rat and absolutely <laughs> doesn't believe it. He knows it's not there, although he could see it, and he plays that so well. And then right at the end, you see Basil being being dragged out. I'm very very fond of that episode because again, there's quite a lot in it. And there's some very good lines early on. I love uh, when, when uh, Manuel, of course, thinks that it's a filigree Siberian hamster and Basil persuades him he's a rat. He said, don't you have rats? He said, don't you have rats? In he said, oh, did, did Franco have them all shot? That's one of my favourite lines. <laughs> Well,
when we started writing The Kipper and the Corpse, we started with the idea of getting rid of a dead body. And I was fascinated by the idea of, of trying to get Basil very happy about the fact someone had, de uh, had died. So we, we, we came up with the idea that he thought he'd, he'd poisoned him, and then when he discovered he hadn't poisoned him, he'd be really happy, and then the doctor could walk in when he was around, you know, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. <laughs> Again, utter ruthless selfishness. No thought for this guy or his family at all. It's just, is he on the hook or is he off the hook? As I say, he's a terrible man.